show up. Continues. Marion Carver loved to write poetry. Originally an investment banker, at 40 she was divorced and had not worked since before her marriage. She lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and her 13-year-old daughter was staying with her father in England. No one is sure why, but in August of 2004, Marion decided to take a cruise, a seven-day Royal Caribbean celebrity Alaskan cruise. She left word with no one, not even her family. One day, Marion's dad got a frantic call from his granddaughter. She said, do you know where my mother is? I've been calling her and I haven't gotten a response. After a few more days of unreturned phone calls, Kendall and Carol Carver filed a missing persons report. A couple of weeks went by, and then police discovered that Marion had purchased a cruise ticket. But when Carver called the cruise line, he received some shocking news. Officials confirmed that Marion got on the cruise. They just weren't sure if she had gotten off. Seemed like kind of a, a rather basic thing. If you put 2,000 people on a ship, you ought to know if 2,000 people got off the ship. They, they didn't know that. They couldn't tell us that. Carver became more alarmed when they casually explained that Marion stopped using her room after the second night and that her belongings remained in her cabin after everyone else got off the ship. They got rid of most of her stuff. A gold wristwatch, all of her clothes were gone, vanished. In effect, Marion vanished from the earth. Royal Caribbean gave Marion's clothes to charity and worst of all, told no one she was unaccounted for. Not the police, not the family. She was gone. And uh, the purse uh, that had her name, social security number and everything, they just put it in storage, did nothing. Why would the cruise line do something like that? Carver wanted answers. Retired and living in Phoenix, the former head of an insurance company went back into CEO mode and launched the type of counteroffensive the cruise line probably wasn't expecting. Eventually, he would spend more than $75,000. We wanted to talk to somebody on that boat that had seen Mary. Now, that seemed like a pretty reasonable request. If I could have located somebody that uh, observed Marion, uh, we would be able to determine if she was in the cabin by herself, in the cabin with someone else. Uh, we might have been able to get some information. Tim Schmolder was the San Francisco private eye dispatched to board the Mercury more than a month after Carver started asking questions. He says Royal Caribbean provided some information, but also set up some roadblocks. The request for the interviews denied. The identity of the cabin attendant denied. Limitations as to the amount of time that I can spend on the ship. Access allowed to the cabin, but access denied to the video camera system. He made this videotape on the ship, demonstrating the route from Marion's room to the nearest deck where she could have gone overboard. My report became, you know, kind of empty of content, but full of questions. Questions as to why I couldn't uh, interview the security manager for the camera system. Question after question after question. Why, why, why? What was going on? Did they know more and simply weren't telling? For four months, Carver was in limbo waiting for answers until finally he took legal action. Even then, he felt stonewalled. Carver asked for a list of passengers from the Boston area where Marion lived. Maybe someone could provide a clue. I got this listing, uh, which is a listing of 2,000 people. There's no information on this list that would allow me to find anybody. From all of our subpoenas, we, we got one item, and that was this rather poor quality uh, picture of Marion getting on the ship. That's all we got. But the worst news had yet to come. When Carver's attorneys forced Royal Caribbean to make the cabin attendant named Domingo Montero available for a deposition. Carver was crushed by what he heard. He says the cruise line had information all along and there was a cover-up. Domingo said he reported Marion missing daily uh, and to his boss and that at the end of the cruise Marion sings her in the room where they'd been for five days. He asked his boss should we report this? And the boss says no. He says I'll take care of it. Just put all of her belongings in a bag, put them in my locker, and I'll take care of it. 
Next, they learn that since Carver started complaining, Royal Caribbean held an internal hearing and fired Domingo, the cabin attendant's boss. But during all those months that Carver had been asking questions, the cruise line never told him about this. All along the way, they've been lying to us, you know, they, and leading us down a path. And uh, I said, it's tough enough to lose a daughter, let alone be dealing with a cover-up. Carver says these Royal Caribbean documents are evidence of a cover-up. This shows the company taking great pains to make sure that Domingo did not speak with anybody. In this memo, Royal Caribbean checks with 14 different employees to make sure Domingo hasn't spoken to outside sources. We showed the document to Royal Caribbean's attorney, Jeffrey Maltzman. He says it's no big deal. If you look at that document, nowhere does it say, don't talk to someone if they call you. It simply says, please find out from the people involved if they've talked to anybody about this. Mr. Maltzman, though, you know this cruise line kept this information from the family for months. And if you were representing the family in this situation, you'd have a field day with a document like this that shows a clear effort by the cruise line to shut this guy up. I disagree completely. I don't think that's what the document says, and I don't think that's what it was intended to. If only they'd done something during that cruise when she was reported missing daily, we would have known, hey, Marine's on the ship, off the ship, or whatever. But uh, here we've been led down a path. Royal Caribbean further infuriated the family when they issued this press release, stating that Marion appears to have committed suicide on our ship. Do you know enough now to think it was a suicide as you put out in your statement? Well, I don't think it's the cruise line's position to say what happened. They don't have that expertise. That's law enforcement's job. Why would the cruise line put out a statement saying it was a suicide, and then you sit there and say, well, we don't know enough to know what happened? There's really nothing that we're putting out as a conclusion. This is coming from the Carver family telling us what they believe happened to their daughter on board the ship. Carver says that's not true. He concedes suicide is a possibility but says Royal Caribbean's bungling of the case will prevent him from ever knowing the truth. Connecticut Congressman Christopher Shays learned about Carver's case after one of his constituents complained to him about a similar incident. Eventually, he called for a congressional subcommittee hearing and was unimpressed when Royal Caribbean's director of security expressed words of sympathy to the Carver family. Again, our hearts go out to the family. This it would be this better if you cooperated with the family. Y your actions would speak more loudly than your statement, frankly, and your actions appear not to support your sorrow. The last piece of Marion the family has to hold on to is this picture frame, which plays a recorded message. Hi, Dad, this is Marion. I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. The Carvers worry that they'll never really know why their daughter disappeared. Next, from clowning around to man overboard, a 10-story fall from the top deck, and the ship steams away as he's left fighting for life in the Gulf of Mexico for the next 17 hours. When lost at sea, return. Spend hours in the ocean and survive? 